Welcome to our Brave Church at Home service. We're so glad you could join us today. If it's your first time with us, can I encourage you at the end of the service to visit our website, fill in a connection form, and one of our team would love to get in touch with you. Let's just pray, shall we? Father God, we thank you for a new day. We thank you for the opportunity to hear your word. And God, we pray that you would speak to us today and that we would listen. And God, that we would do what you're asking of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't we check out the rest of the service? This week's Brave Kids Church is all about, and the title of it is David Serves Saul. Serves him what? Serves him right? No. Food? No, 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 no. It's David Serves Saul. So David helps, David looks after, works for Saul. Oh, right. Mm. Grace still homeschooling. Oh, yes. Yes, she is. Make sure you pay attention to this next video. Saul did not follow God like he was supposed to, and for that reason, God chose to take the kingdom from Saul's family and give it to David's. David became a great warrior. And everyone in the kingdom loved David. This made Saul jealous, and Saul hated David because he thought he would try to kill him and take the throne from his family. So Saul wanted to kill David. Whoa! Saul hunted David, but he couldn't catch him. One day, Saul heard that David was in the wilderness of En Gedi. So Saul gathered 3,000 of his skilled fighters and went to find and kill David. During Saul's search for David, he went in a cave to relieve himself. Well, this very cave was the one where David and his men were hiding. And when David's men saw that Saul was unaware that David was there and unable to defend himself, they said, Now's your chance, David. This is God telling you that he will give you your enemy to do with as you wish. So David crept forward and cut off a piece of Saul's robe. But then David began to think that it was not right for him to take Saul's life. For no matter how much hardship and difficulty Saul had caused him, it was still not right for him to hurt the one who God had placed over Israel. So David told his men to back off, and he did not let them kill King Saul. They waited until after Saul had left the cave, and then David ran out of the cave and shouted after Saul, My king, why do you listen to people who say I am trying to harm you? Look, I cut it off, but I didn't kill you. This proves that I am not trying to harm you and that I have not sinned against you, even though you've been hunting me. David went on to promise that he would never harm Saul. David said that God would be the one to protect David and to rescue him from Saul's power. Saul said, is that really you, David? And he began to cry. Saul said, You are a better man than I. You have been amazingly kind to me today, for when God put me in a place where you could have killed me, you didn't do it. Who else would have done this? And now I realize that you are surely going to be king, and the kingdom of Israel will flourish under your rule. But promise me that when that happens, you will not kill my family. So David promised that he would not hurt Saul's family, and they left each other in peace. So now I'm going to ask Simon some questions about that video. Are you ready? I am so ready. What was David chosen to do when he was just a boy? Oh, I know this one. Uh, the king of Israel. 
Yeah, that is correct. Yes. Question number two. What did Saul do wrong, which resulted in him losing his kingdom? Oh, I know this one as well. He did not follow God. That is correct. Yes. Well done. And the final question, question number three. What did David promise Saul? Oh, I know this one as well. He would never harm him or his family. Well done. Yes. God chose David to be king over Israel when he was just a boy, just like he planned Jesus to be born in a stable in Bethlehem. You know, it's good to know that God has a plan for all of us, no matter how old we are. So now we're going to do our memory verse. And Simon, are you ready? Oh, I think so. So. Okay, repeat after me. Okay. May the Lord reward you well. May the Lord reward you well. For the way you have treated me today. For the way you have treated me today. 1 Samuel 24 verse 19. 1 Samuel 24 verse 19. Awesome. Shall we do it together? Awesome. awesome. Channeling our inner grace. Oh. Ready? May the, the Lord, Lord reward, reward you well. well. For the, the way, way you, you have treated, treated me today. <laughs> oh. 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 <laughs> well, for the way. <laughs> Are you ready to do it together? Yes, I am. Let's go. May, May the, the Lord reward you well. well for the, the way you, you have treated me today. today. 1, 1 Samuel 24, 24 verse 19. 19. So now Simon's going to pray for us, so why don't you gather us a family? <laughs> I was Is that funny? I was <laughs> Is that funny that Simon's going to pray for us? Yeah. So now Simon's going to pray for us, so why don't you bow your heads and close your eyes? Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for all the plans you have for us. Plans to prosper us and not to harm us. Help us to be more like David and to do the right thing in difficult situations. Thank you, God. Amen. Amen. This week, we want you to have a think about how you treat others and remember to treat them well. Bye. Bye.
As a church, we have the amazing opportunity to partner with a great organisation called Compassion, whose vision globally is to see children released from poverty in Jesus' name. And as a church, we sponsor and support over 100 children in the beautiful country of Rwanda. So I just want to share with you where things are up to for them during this pandemic. Last March, when things first started, the government were very quick to bring in lockdown restrictions. And as a result of that, as a country, they've seen just over 15,800 cases of people being infected with the virus and over 200 deaths. For the children and families and support workers involved with Compassion, there's been just over 100 cases, the majority of whom are now fully recovered. The children aren't able to uh, visit the projects at the moment, but the Compassion staff are working really hard to keep in touch with the families to ensure that they have all the health support and food supplies that they need. And also they've been doing training online for any of the staff workers and family members who might need some health training. The children are now back in school though, and obviously with social distancing rules, they're having to wear masks and make sure that they're washing their hands regularly. So please do pray for the children because this is obviously a very new situation for them to be involved with. Can I encourage you too to keep writing to the children? They are getting their letters and those letters really do make a massive difference to them. Maybe just share a scripture with them, something that's been encouraging you during this season. Eugene and the team over in Rwanda have been praying for us as well and um, he shared a scripture with me which I'd like to just share with you that's been a real support and encouragement for them. It's Psalm 46 verse 1 and it says, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Shall we just pray for the uh, amazing work of compassion for all that's going on in Rwanda? Father, we thank you that you've been with the country of Rwanda. Thank you for your protection over them and your provision for them. Thank you for the wisdom of the government and thank you for the ongoing support that Compassion staff are bringing to the children and to their families. God, we pray particularly for the children that you would help them to keep um, working and just remembering the different restrictions that they have to work towards. God, please protect them. Please keep them safe and their families too. And God, we ask that you would bless them in all that they do and give them your peace. In Jesus' name, Amen. Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. We just want to create a space now for us to worship together. And so I just encourage you to put aside everything that's been going on in your world this week and just fix your eyes on Jesus. He's the centre of everything and we just want to give him all the praise and all the glory that we can now. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Come and fall. Spirit burn like a fire deep within. Come and breathe again. Renew every fiber of my being. I want to be near you. Spirit.
Hey, good morning and welcome again to Church at Home. And so glad, so privileged to be able to share these few moments with you. We've been talking over the last few weeks about how to build a life of stability, to be the last house standing. I encourage you to go back and watch the um, other parts of this series and uh, learn some foundational truths that you can build your life on. And we've been talking especially over the last couple of weeks about resilience. How do we build resilience? We define resilience as the ability to bounce back and keep going. And uh, I want to talk and get really practical today and uh, and quite uh, close probably to some of the things that you feel on the inside as well. And I want to talk to you about how to get unstuck. How to get unstuck. And really what we're talking about is we're talking about how to move past two things. Failure and rejection. Uh, It's crazy, isn't it, that when you think back over your life, you could probably pinpoint moments where you felt rejected, where you weren't selected for a team, where you got a no, 
where a social group, you were kind of on the outside and you weren't accepted as you should have been or wanted to be and scarred by the jobs that we've gone for and not got, knows that we've received um, when we've put ourselves out there and it gets on the inside of us. We could think of moments where we failed. Uh, I'm a specialist in my life at failure. Um, I've failed so many times. As a Christ follower, I thought when I became a Christian at 17 that I would fail less, and that's not true. Um, I still fail. I have done, I think back to uh, one particular time I went on a, a Christian conference away for a week, and I was around uh, Christians. Uh, there's nothing like being around Christians to uh, bring out what's on the inside of you, hey? And I remember one particular person um, who, by the way, you don't know, you'd have never met them, um, who was winding me up, skin underneath my skin. And I remember this particular day, we were, we were at each other, and I flipped and, uh, and literally let out a barrage at this Christian conference, right? where everyone's trying to behave their best and act their best and all got their Bibles under their arms um, and all got their Sunday best on and all amen and praise God. And not that there's anything wrong with all that, by the way, having a Bible under your arm and saying amen and praising God. Those are good things. Um, but you know what I mean? Um, it was like, a, you know, what you would envisage a, a Christian conference to be. And I flipped out and shouted at the top of my voice just the most explicit swear words you can think of at this person. This person didn't know what to do. They were shocked. Um, and I've let them have it. And, uh, and you know, sometimes when we let people have it, we think we're going to feel better about ourselves, don't we? And I remember walking away and just feeling this weight come over me of just feeling grotty, you know, just feeling shame, guilt. And I remember having to go back and later on apologize to that person and put things right and move on. And that can be tough sometimes, forgiving yourself when you get things wrong. You know, even in this season, because that's not, that's just, that's not just historical stuff. We're still failing, aren't we? In this season, I've been homeschooling my kids. And there are some days we have a great day. And there are other days, especially when I'm doing fractions with Seth, um, and I'm trying to show him how to do fractions after having to figure it out myself. Um, and uh, these new ways of doing fractions uh, and figuring them out and then showing him and he doesn't get it. And I get frustrated and we end up falling out. And it's more of a reflection on my teaching than his learning. Um, and I get stressed with him because he can't get it. And then we have to come back, I have to apologize and, and we'll start again, start right back at the beginning and go again. Uh, and it takes, let me say, it takes resilience to to overcome rejection and failure. And when you look at the biblical story, you see, you see ca character after character who faced rejection and who faced failure. Think of Jacob who deceives his family and then is rejected by his, his family. You'll see Joseph who's rejected by his brothers and, and fails because he has a wrong view of his own purpose. You see people like David who's rejected by the family out in the fields, not considered as worthy of being king, but who God chooses. And later on in his life, you'll find there's, there's great failures that he has in his life. That's one of the things I love about scripture is he doesn't dress up these amazing characters and only show you their good side. It shows you the warts and all, their ups, their downs, their twists and turns. When you think about Peter in the New Testament denying Jesus, and then in the, the church, the New Testament, all that superiority complex being dealt with in him. You think of Paul and Paul's failure, quite public failure in terms of persecuting the very people who were of the faith that he would eventually die for. It's full of, of failure and rejection. And when you think about Jesus himself, I love this scripture, uh, Isaiah chapter 53 uh, the chapter of the suffering servant. It's a passage of scripture that was written years before Jesus came to this earth. And this is, this is literally a prophetic word, a future description of what Jesus would go through. And it says this, he is, was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we hid, we held him 
in law esteem. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 4 says this. It says, as you come to him, Jesus, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. There's this picture that Jesus himself faced rejection quite vividly, that the leaders of the day did not accept him, that humankind did not accept him, but rejected him. And yet the stone that the builders rejected was chosen by God. What a great verse, right? That the stone the builders rejected was chosen by God. God chose him. And in the same way, he chose you and me. He calls you and me sons and daughters. We talked about that in week one, which gives us and helps us to move past uh, our own failure and our own um, moments of rejection from others. But here's what I know about failure and rejection is that if we're not careful, they get stuck on us and stuck on our soul without us even realizing and start affecting who we are. In our house, uh, Phoebe, my daughter, she loves glitter uh, slime. Even the name of it just sounds wrong, doesn't it? Glitter slime. And it comes in these little pots like Play-Doh pots and you open it up and it's literally this elasticated slime that you pull and mold and throw and it sticks on stuff. And we have to be careful where she plays with it because we, we've made the mistake in the past of letting her play in a bedroom with it. And you go in a bedroom afterwards, it's stuck on the curtains, it's stuck on the floor, it's stuck on a bed, it's stuck on her toys, it's stuck in her hair, it's stuck on the dog. It gets everywhere and you have to peel it off and and it's hard to get off and scrub it off. And sometimes you have to cut, um, you know, the the doll's hair in order to get it out. It gets everywhere. And that's a little bit like failure and rejection. When we don't bounce back from it and develop resilience in going again and not letting what other people uh, have said about us or the way that they've treated us to affect us in a negative way. Is, is we've got to develop resilience to bounce back, to not let it get stuck on us and change us in a negative way, but we've got to move on from it and to grow in it. We want to be people who are connected to people. Of course we do. We don't ever want to retreat from people. We want to love people, serve people, help people, minister to people, journey with people. God's put us together on this journey, but we've got to be more concerned with what God says about us than what people say about us. Connected to people, but concerned with what God says about us. And what does he say about us? You're my son, you're my daughter, in whom I am well pleased. Before you've done a thing, before you're defined by your failures, before you're defined by your rejection, on the inside yourself, hear what God has to say about you and me. And so often when when we listen to what others say about us, we're giving them the authority. Um, and it matters what people think about us. Let's be honest, it matters. But when we when we listen, when we our lives are defined by what people say, is we're giving them the, uh, the authority that only God should have. Only God has the authority to define you. Other people can encourage you in your gift and in who you are and champion you. That's good to have people around you do that. But only God has the authority to define you. And when God speaks over you, he speaks love. He speaks grace. He speaks compassion. He speaks favor because he loves you like his child. Only he deserves the authority in our lives. And I think there's a way in life to use failure and rejection to not pull us back or create a negative version of us, but to help propel us forward. I stumbled across this concept called post-traumatic growth. You've heard of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, which is a very real thing that affects um, people who've been through traumatic situations and circumstances later on. It affects you in terms of your stress and your inner world. But there's such a thing also as post-traumatic growth. Which means this, and it's this thought that uh, going through a traumatic event like failing um, or being rejected, because those things affect us emotionally. You know, we can pretend they don't, but they do. They affect us. Going through something like that can actually, or any form of trauma in life, can you can actually find a way to use it to propel you forward. And these are the ways that it can propel you forward that we're told. In this theory, it's number one, you can have a greater appreciation for life. When you've gone through something significant or loss or hardship or failure or rejection, you just have a greater appreciation for life. 
Number two, if you use it in a positive way, this is. Number two, there can be spiritual development as you engage with deeper questions of humanity and, and the world and God himself. Number three, you could have closer relationships that you find out who really matters and you want to draw close to those. And number four, you can develop new personal strength that comes through you journeying through adversity. And I love this phrase that if we do that, if we choose to have to use negative things in a positive way, it can propel us forward so that we don't just bounce back, but get this, we bounce forward. So we don't just bounce back and go again, but we bounce forward, become a better version of us. We become wiser. We become more connected. We become more appreciative. It's flipping it all together, post-traumatic growth. Viktor uh, Frankl said this, who's a Holocaust survivor. He said, suffering ceases to be suffering when it is given meaning. Suffering ceases to be suffering when it is given meaning. What if we could use our suffering to create something that we could become not worse, but better. Not more disconnected, but more connected. Not, not more, not more um, unaware of God in our lives, but more aware. Not less concerned, but more concerned. How, how could we do that? I wonder, I wonder if we could give our suffering meaning that it could create. It has creative properties. Think about that. Suffering has creative properties properties. Your failure has creative properties. The rejection you faced, that no, that, that not being invited to the party, that divorce, that relational breakdown, that moment of failure, that moment of rejection, it has creative properties. It has the ability, if you use it in a way that will benefit you and humanity and, and allow God to get involved in the midst of it. It could create something in you which is better, not worse than what you've been. You are not defined by what you've done or what you've been or way, the way you've been treated. You are defined by God and it can create growth in you and me. It's not easy, but it can happen. And I know that each and every one of us has faced failure. We've all failed and we've all gone through moments of rejection. But I love this scripture, what Paul says in 2 Corinthians. And I pray that this brings you comfort in the midst of your own failings and in the midst of your own facing rejection. It's Paul, he speaks, he says, Praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort who comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort that we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. Two titles that are given to God there that should bring you some encouragement today. If this is striking a chord or touching a nerve, if you could put your finger on right now the moments of failure, the things that you're still holding yourself accountable for, and you, you, you've got you know, consequences are very real. You've got to journey through things, but you've got to learn to forgive yourself as well. And sometimes guilt sticks on us, and and we got to move past that. And maybe there's a point of rejection, maybe even from your childhood as you've grown up, or experiences you've had that you're still living out your days in light of that rejection. I want this to bring you encouragement today. Here's the two titles that God's given. He's the Father of Compassion. So he's not removed himself from your life because of the failure or rejection. He's compassionate towards you and me. I love that. When I mess up, God's compassionate towards me. He's not in judgment of me. He's compassionate towards me. He wants to come close. And secondly, he's the God of all comfort, the father of compassion and the God of all comfort. That he doesn't want to watch from a distance. He wants to come and get involved and he wants to embrace you and me. And he wants to comfort us in our failure and the feeling of rejection. And he wants us to heal us from it so that we can move forward. That's what Paul says. 
that when you've moved forward now because you, God's been compassionate to you and you've experienced his comfort, then now you can journey to a place where you can extend that compassion and comfort to others, which what? It gives us hope. It gives us hope that we are not defined by our failure and by what other people have said about us and by rejection, but we can move forward and we can be a, a blessing to other people. Three things that I think we learned from that scripture really quick, and then I'm going to give us some practical tips on how we can begin to move past this. Number one, you need help sometimes to bounce back. You need help sometimes. Yeah, God wants to comfort you. God's compassionate, but sometimes you need some people in your corner. I've got a few people in my corner, my wife, who champions me, who no matter how far I've fallen, no matter what I've gone through in life, she'll always champion me to go again and to get up and to and because she loves me for who I am not from what I've not for what I've done the same way as as God does and there's other people my family some of my family just champion me get around me you need a couple of people sometimes you need a team sometimes you just need to get people around you who are going to encourage you to to bounce back and to keep moving past your failure past the rejection number two you need other people not other people sorry need you to help them bounce back Other people need you to help them bounce back. So this, you know, you can't, you can't be there for everyone, but you can be there for someone. And some people don't want your help. You've got to realize that as well. But there are some people who do and who need your help, need you a part of their team to encourage them, to pray with them, to, to uh, strengthen them, to call the God uh, gifts that are inside them out and to move forward. And number three, someone needs your struggle. Someone needs your struggle. Paul says that when we've received the comfort of God, we can then extend the comfort of God to others. So you're going to need to become, move through it and journey to a healthy place to not be scarred by it and still living in the pain of failure and rejection. But you're going to move beyond it because someone else needs your struggle. They need the lessons that you've learned in the midst of your struggle. So we've got to get through failure and rejection and not become bitter, but get better. And here's the, here's the reality. Uh, maybe you're thinking, well, you don't know my circumstance. You don't know how far I've fallen. You don't know what I've done. You don't know how other people have treated me. You don't know how it's stuck on me and how I feel about myself on the inside. Maybe I don't. But here's what I do know. That we serve a God who specializes in bringing life out of dead things. He brings life out of dead things. He was crucified on a cross and three days later, he rose again. It's the bedrock belief of our Christian faith that he died for our faith and life was brought back into him through the power of the spirit. He resurrected what was dead and he can do the same in your life. So what has been put to death? What has died in your life? What part of you has died when you failed? What part of you died when you felt rejection that God wants to resurrect because he specializes in bringing to life and the new thing is far better than the old thing. Paul tells us that when he talks about our future spiritual bodies, that they're an upgrade. They're way beyond what we've had before. God wants to make a better version of You, He can help you move through your failure. He can help you move through your rejection if you'll allow him. And he can use them. He can use your greatest setback to set up your greatest comeback. He can use your greatest setback to set up your greatest comeback. So here's just a few practical things we can do before we pray. How do we come back from failure and rejection? Number one, we get honest. So don't pretend, you know, sometimes I do this when I failed or when I've been rejected, I pretend like it's not affected me. No, it's, it affects us. It hurts. It's tough. We can be honest about that. But let's not stop there. You know, we live in a world that likes to get honest, but doesn't want to move beyond honesty to health. There's a step beyond honesty and it's health. It's healing. It's wholeness. God wants to do that in us. So get honest, not with everyone. Don't need to plaster it all over the place and tell it, but it's just a couple of people. Get honest. I'm hurt. I'm hurting. I'm struggling to forgive myself. I'm struggling to move forward. And I'm, and I'm harboring, um, a feeling of, um, pain, hurt, you know, on the inside from being rejected. The second thing you can do real practically is give yourself a break. Give yourself a break. I'm harder on myself than I am anybody else. I don't know about you. 
when I'm talking to somebody else who's failed or been rejected, I want to count, bring compassion, I want to bring love. But with myself, it's, it's harsher. Give yourself a break. Offer yourself some kindness. How about that? Offer yourself some kindness. Be kind to yourself. Number three, look for the lesson. Oh, I want to use it to grow me. Look for the lesson. What can I learn here? What did I do wrong? How did I make the mistake? Did I give people too much authority in my life to speak and define me? Or is that, is that now I need to just attribute that to God? And yeah, be built up by others and encouraged by others and challenged by others. Of course I can. I want that still. But God has the, God has the authority to define me. What lesson do I need to learn? And number four, which is tough, move on. Move on. You weren't made, meant to live. You learn from your failure and rejection, but you weren't meant to live in failure and rejection. You can either be wrecked by it or you can be redirected in it. You can be wrecked by it, damaged, a negative version of yourself now, or you can be redirected into a positive, better you on the other side as God begins to heal you. It's amazing how our past experiences affect our present reality. I remember a few years ago, me and Rachel moved house and we moved into this house that had wallpaper on every wall and ceiling. And we don't really like wallpaper on everything and everywhere. We wanted nice, clean, plastered, painted walls. And so I stripped the house of all this wallpaper. And one particular day I was up on a ladder in what would be mine and Rachel's bedroom. And I was stripping off the wallpaper off the ceiling. I was on a, the top step of the six foot ladder. And I remember giving it my all and I just lost my balance, slipped off the ladder, slipped onto its side and I landed on my head on the floor in a mound of sticky paper that had been ripped off the walls and the ceilings. And I led there, the first thought I had, no one else was in the house, the first thought I had was, man, I, that could have been really, really dangerous. I could have killed myself. I don't have a great history um, with ladders. But I, a couple of months ago, I was down at, at church and I was going up one of the big ladders that we have. And I just felt a little bit, I never had a problem with heights, just felt a little bit shaky. And I was thinking, why am I feeling so shaky with heights? And then my mind immediately went back to that ladder I'd been up that day and fell off since that moment. I didn't, I was never afraid of heights. I was reckless before then. And it just, you know, it just affects you, doesn't it? Then there's wisdom. You've got to make sure you're secure. But I just thought to myself, nah, I don't want to let my past experience affect my present reality. And so I had the little self-talk by myself and shot up this great big ladder and did what I needed to do and got back down and felt good about myself because I hadn't let my past experience dictate my present reality. I don't want to be held back by some things. And I know that's a silly illustration about something trivial, but the same is true in life when it comes to the things that we face as well, that we don't want our past experiences, what we failed in and what we've experienced negatively and how other people have treated. We don't want that to affect our present reality. We don't want that to stop us extending love and compassion and grace and putting ourselves in the way of God to be used by God. I wonder if we could use all the negative that has happened to us to create a positive effect in us and grow us as we move forward. And as we do that, we're going to have to get before God and say, God, show me your compassion and bring your comfort. Let me pray for you, God. I pray for everyone watching today. I pray, God, no one is um, removed from this. We have all fallen short. We've all failed. We've all had times and moments where we're so angry with ourselves because of what we've done. And God, um, I pray you'd meet us in that place. Pray for those who are there right now. I pray you'd meet us in that place. I pray for those who've been there who are still carrying the pain of it. I pray you'd come bring comfort and healing. I pray for those who've been rejected and are still living out their, their life based on what others have said about them and the way others have treated them. God, I pray for freedom that comes through your presence. Help us live free, not bound up still, not tight and short of breath whenever we talk about it or think about it or think about that person or think about that situation, but free, we wanna be free in you. And so I pray you'd come help us Use everything we've been through to create and form yourself in as we pray. And most of all today, I pray, Holy Spirit, whoever's watching, wherever they're watching, would they experience the comfort of your Holy Spirit, knowing that you're with them and they can journey through. You're the God who brings life out of death. And we speak that over the dead places in us and over the dead circumstances that we're aware of. We speak life 
In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Looking forward to being with you again next week. Next week, I'm going to speak to someone who's, um, who's learned how in the trials and struggles of life to build resilience that created a firm foundation in their lives. Look forward to being with you, sharing that. Have a great week, guys, and we'll see you soon. Take care. What a great message for us today and full of wisdom for us to build our lives on. And every week, we love to give people the opportunity to begin their own journey with Jesus. And if that's you today, can I encourage you to pray this prayer with me? Dear Lord Jesus, I acknowledge I need a saviour. I confess today that you are the Son of God and Lord of all. I ask that you would forgive me of my wrongdoing. I know you died on the cross for my sin and rose again so that we could have victory and freedom. I now give you my life. Help me follow you and experience you in my days. I trust in you. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, can I encourage you to go to our website and fill in a response form and one of our team will contact you and we'd love to just be able to pray with you as you begin your journey. Don't forget to stay connected with us throughout the week via social media. You'll find us on Facebook, Instagram and on YouTube. And tomorrow we begin our new reading plan with the Uversion app and it's called Cazone. And um, this is by Craig Rochelle and it's a great plan just about discovering the vision and plan that God has for your life. If you're not sure how to find that or what to do, if you just email us at hello at bravechurch.co.uk, someone will be able to help you. Have a great week.